All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Seren Bagdasarian, and I'll be presenting with Kent Overstreet, who is uh, calling in. Kent, can you hear us? Hello, hello. All right. OK, we can hear you, too. So we will talk about uh, memory allocation profiling today. And Mike, I promise I'll write a documentation for it if it goes <laughs> any anywhere. Um, so uh, I'll try to go quickly over the slides, and then we can have a discussion. Uh, so why we are doing it? We want to um, account all kernel allocations, including early allocations, allocations from modules. So, and uh, usage examples could be memory leak detec detection, memory, m uh, some monitoring of the usage, identifying regressions, and uh, possibly other um, usages. So, requirements that we have is very low overhead so that we can enable this in production. That's one of the requirements uh, because this is not a debug feature. We want to, it to be, uh, we want to be able to turn it always on. And the second one is to provide enough information to be useful. We want the information to be actionable. So it's hard to satisfy both. That's why we came up with two-level solution. Basically, one provides you always on high-level visibility of things that's happening, but with very uh, low um, detail. But And the second one is detailed view where you can say, oh, this allocation looks suspicious. Let's, let me dig it into it. So, I enable a context capture for that particular location, and we get much more information, like call stacks for each allocation, uh, uh, PID, timestamp, and so on. So implementation-wise, we came up with this coding, uh, code tagging um, uh, framework. So it's, uh, code tagging is a mechanism to inject a structure which uh, identifies a code location. And uh, based on your application, and memory profiling is one of such applications, you can attach to each code tag additional field, field or structure. So in, in this case, we are attaching a counter. We'll be counting how many bytes were allocated from this particular code location. Uh, there are other applica uh, applications. We showed that in, uh, in the original RFC. Um, we implemented dynamic fault injection, latency tracking, improved error codes. Um, and the, um, using this, basically, we, it provides us with a low overhead solution, and we can attach custom logic and data based on, on the application. So this is basically the uh, most intrusive part. That's why we are highlighting it here. Uh, how we, it, uh, it works, we, we have to um, wrap the calls which uh, we want to instrument with this macro, basically, a hook. Uh, and what that hook does is basically it creates a code tag. This is the first line here in specific uh, alloc tags elf section. Then it stores that code tag in the task structs uh, additional fields that we created. It calls the allocator. And then it restores uh, previously set uh, uh, field in that task struct. Uh, so this way we can support uh, nesting. So what allocators does internally, there is uh, there is a call to alloc tag um, uh, inc and dex. So uh, during the allocation, it will increment the code tag for that uh, saved in that task struct. And it will also store a reference to that code tag in the uh, page extension or slab object extension, depending on which object it is. So that when we free the object, we, we know which code tag needs to be decremented. Um, so, overhead. Uh, performance overhead, um, thanks to this, basically, uh, mechanism, we, we get quite low performance overhead. For slab, it's 36. For page allocation, it's 26%. It sounds high, but those paths are very, very op highly optimized, so they are very quick. So even uh, adding uh, per CPU increment, decrement operations result in pretty high um, uh, overhead well, visible overhead, but if we compare with other mechanisms like MemCGs, it's 10 times faster than slab and five times faster than page allocation, uh, the, for the MemCG for page allocations. And memory overhead, I just did a rough estimate. Basically, it will depend on number of CPUs because we are using per CPU counters for every code tag. And it also depends on number of allocation sites, of course, because every allocation site is instrumented. 
So wrap estimate on eight gigabyte, eight core Android device with assuming 10,000 allocation size, which is overestimation. On my uh, Fedora machine, I saw that it's 4,800 something allocation size. So 10,000 is pretty, pretty high. Um, so we come up uh, to about 26, 27, uh, actually, yeah, around 27 megabytes of overhead, which is 0.3% of total memory. I'm sure we can improve this. We just didn't spend too much time optimizing the size of those things. Um, so that's pretty much the overview of what we are doing. And I would like to open it for a discussion. What we are interested in getting the feedback on uh, general usefulness. Like if you had this uh, mechanism today, would you use it? How would you use it? We would love to hear any additional use cases that we might have missed. Uh, we would like to uh, talk about the concerns, maintenance costs, runtime overhead, memory overhead, maybe some other concerns. And I know there are some other great ideas too. We would like to talk about those too. <laughs> now is it on? Okay. Hi, Kent. Um, so, uh, Mikhail came to me and he asked me uh, on Monday if it's possible to uh, use static calls to do this. Now, I guess the issue that we have that I've read on the mailing lists is the fact that doing, if you go back to the code, mm -hmm. doing this is kind of like adding uh, basically a bunch of macros around all the interfaces. So, we have to make sure that every interface has this macro and it could, you know, Every time you add a new interface or whatever that, you have to put these things in to um, make this. And what happens is this code now gets injected into the, all the call sites. So basically, every single call site has this code embedded in there. And there's a few issues. Cache, uh, maybe one of the problems could be you know, when it's enabled or even it's disabled or whatever you want, you have this code is executed. You can't turn it on or off or anything. Uh, it will um, bloat the instruction cache and such not. And so I, uh, when Mikhail said, is there a way to do um, uh, static calls? If you're not familiar with static calls, um, what it does is, I mean, tracing uses this. It's basically a way you have a call that you actually does uh, uh, runtime patching to make it call something different. So you actually can call different things. A lot of things been using it, like you know, KVM has been using it to, like if it boots up and says, oh, this is AMD, it does all the call sites to be a direct call to the AMD code, or if it's Intel, it does Intel. It re it's basically a way to not do indirect calls. Um, so, when I was thinking about this, uh, I brought up, got up a, like, there's a way of doing this using Obstool. Obstool executes uh, at compile time, and it could read and, um, the call locations, and we can actually find, um, using the reloc um, tables in ELF, finding every single place that calls, like, let's just say kmalloc. So I could find every single thing that calls kmalloc. And then what we could do is create a trampoline for every single call. So you'll get a section that creates a little bit of code, and the trampoline not, will actually add the code here, a, a call to kmalloc, and the code back. Now, what's the call to kmalloc will be replaced with a jump. It will jump to the trampoline, do this work, call kmalloc, kmalloc comes back, and then jumps back. And inside the trampoline, you could put your tag, you could hard code the tag, and hard code everything else. It's almost identical to what this is, except it's gonna be a little bit more work that you have to make the trampolines. And actually, with an added benefit, you could technically turn it on and off at runtime. So if you don't want this on, you could disable it by patching it all off. And, it's, it's, yes. Steve, I'd like to jump in. Um, I'd like to see maybe a more concrete proposal on the list, but my reaction when I heard this was that this is taking one set of somewhat magic things as, as we call macros and replacing with a mechanism that's even more magic and black box. We uh, do this all the time this, though. This is, this is several no. pre precedents in there. This is how F-trace works. I know. And this is how and static calls work. This is how, this is how br uh, static branches work. And it's optimized. And it's also the fact that it could be on and off. And the one thing that's great about this, what I really like about this, I think the memory management people like about it, they don't need to worry about it. It basically, yes. It's not going to make maintenance burden go, go away. And there's for advantages yes, to having the actual, 
How will it not? How, okay, wait, 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 wait. How would it not take the way the maintenance burden? Steve, Steve, can you not talk over me so much? Can you not try to take over our presentation? So Go on. Uh, it would not. Uh, th there's really value to the, uh, the source code annotations. Uh, it's not just uh, game log, uh, for example, that we need to instrument. Uh, it's it needs to be the choice for the programmer that's working on the code which function in the call stack is the one that gets instrumented at. Uh, for example, in uh, file system code, uh, fsino.c uh, has a thin wrapper around an allocation. Uh, this makes it a two-line source code change to move the accounting to the correct location. Uh, I think having the, the hooks be documented in, in the code, this is a documentation feature. This isn't a bad thing or a maintenance burden. This is, this is a good thing. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide too, there's also another uh, whole code tagging. Uh, this one? Or? The last slide. Oh, the last slide. The next thing to do with the uh, oh, Alicux macro. Oh, this one? Yeah, the Alicux macro isn't just for uh, accounting. Uh, we've got better fault injection uh, in the pipeline too. And better fault injection, uh, speaking as a file system developer, is something that we really need for better code coverage in our testing and a whole host of reasons. And right now, the, the code coverage, or, sorry, the fault injection capabilities that we've got are not ergonomic. With this Aliquix macro, it is a two-line change to make every single memory allocation in the kernel a fault injection point, which means that we can write tests that trivially iterate through every memory allocation and just uh, inject a fault, run a test, verify that the fault was, was hit. So there's additional value to this. And your proposal, you guys just came up with it, what, last night, and I encourage you guys to explore Monday. it, the list. Um, sure. Uh, okay. So I'll tell you this. First of all, everything you said can still be done in the in the trampoline. Uh, added benefit is we actually extend it. In fact, actually, I would love to have this as a generic feature that you could actually attach to any call site and do um, analysis, not just MM, but like I said, file systems, uh, scheduling, um, anything. So if we could make this generic and actually, like I said, you don't have to write macros all over the place to add it. You just say, you just... What's wrong with macros? Because you have to then actually write the macros over the th um, the, the function. So if you have a function that doesn't, that's not an, in, it's they basically they go in a header file once and you're done. Yeah, but why? That means okay. I could actually anyone could say, hey, I just want to use this facility. This approach sounds a lot easier to me. So okay, Ken, please I'm don't, don't talk over me now. So the point I'm trying to say is, you could then um, have like even a user interface. Like I said, this could be enabled at runtime. That the macros cannot be done. So if I could say, I want to instrument these functions, I could actually do something where I can analyze, if I have the analysis already, I could actually do it so I can have this done and I can enable it at runtime and disable it at runtime. With no, when it's off, is no overhead. There's no iCache pressure. It only happens when you have it enabled. We can even hook BPF into this and do uh, your fault, inter and then do fault inter injection that way. Needs because to be Enable that boot time. There's no use switching it on and off at runtime because then your counters are all off. And we've got the boot switch now. We've if you just care about maybe, we just, okay. well, we do a reset then. But that's that's what I'm just saying. Go and they've said you could, you know, push what you want. But I'm just saying that this kind of came from some of the memory management people that asked me this about this, and I said, here's the solution. I, and I think it would work. I understand. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, let's open right. it up to the rest of the room. Yep. Any other comments, ideas? I mean, uh, the 36% is, is a big overhead, right? So if you can turn it on and off, that seems like a absolute um, must have feature. Yeah, we do have a kill switch right now. I mean, at, at runtime, as well, I, I admit that my latest shiny new toy is is BPF trace. So I'm 
I'm very much persuaded by that whole mindset, and that's where Steve is taking us. Yeah, I, I, it, but I mean that feature of mm -hmm. you have this thing that it's slow, but it gives you critical stuff that you must have. Except that when you don't want to look at that critical stuff, you need to run fast. It, it's a pretty good argument. It's it's, it's inherently not possible uh, to enable accounting at runtime and then have counters that mean anything. Uh, the memory for counters can be allocated. Why it's not? Why, why it's inherently not possible? Uh, because you know, doing... you miss some of the allocations already, then freeze come and they don't see those allocations. So it's basically the same problem. Like if you didn't catch the the allocations at boot time, you you basically don't won't see them. So you disable, you... enable whatever happened be between that. You lost, right? So it's it's not gonna inherently is not gonna be correct anymore. Not perfect. Uh, your, your yes, it's, I understand that you don't you around. won't have allocations between uh, like when it's when the feature is disabled. That but uh, uh, I mean that's a reasonable assumption that, uh, that yes counters are not implemented when uh, the feature is disabled, and that when you enable it your counters start from zero and you get the statistics from like from the time when you enabled it. I guess it, becomes, it just becomes less useful. One, one thing that I also like, so basically you have it boot up enabled, do all your accounting, and then when you're done with it, like, okay, I got the accounting, I could shut it off. So that's the one thing is you don't have to reboot. You can just shut mm -hmm. it off, and then you're done. Yes, once you turn it on, will be an issue, but having it on at boot up, and then be able to disable it without having to do a reboot, and then having full 100% uh, speed again. That we can do with our approach. No, you can't because this is still iCache. This is still in the code path. Uh, how do you ignore? How do you adds, ignore these this stuff? It adds two two, two instructions, instructions to the the allocation paths. It's still going to have a slight two overhead. Instructions. And now another thing that, that the approach that I'm proposing also gives you is the fact that let's say you want to extend it. Maybe you want to do a little bit more than just counting. Maybe you want to do something else. Um, that well, doesn't need, let me, like I said, let me finish. Um, so say if you want to do something else besides just accounting, say if you have another extension, maybe you want to put the BPF programs on there. You could actually have, if you have this support in the kernel where you have multiple trampolines, where you do the things that have to be on all the time so you don't miss it. But say if you want to do some other type of profiling, you can actually change all the call sites to point to the can other you, trampoline. Can you just and slow then, down a little bit? I, I would Sorry. like to respond to something I said earlier. You keep dumping a lot all at once, and I, I can't keep track of it all. Uh, so what was I going to say? Uh, you're talking about overhead, uh, the overhead that our approach uh, has. The, we have to weigh the pros and cons of both approaches. And the con of your approach, though, is that the trampoline has, is much higher overhead than our approach when it actually is in use. Significantly higher. Wait, when it's in use, he said? Yeah. Have you done the measurement? Yeah, I've got a whole other function call. It, no, there is no function call. It's a jump. It's a direct jump to the trampoline, and the trampoline does the call. And then it's a direct jump back, because every, there's a single trampoline for every single call site. So you hard code where you return. Uh, we can do that with static keys. We do that with static keys, but no. Oh, yeah, no. If you put, but no, you have you're gonna have instructions in there. The fact is that inside the code where the, all the call sites are, it's it, compiled with the call. You just replace the call to a jump. But if, if that's all you're doing, then the the size of the knob sleds when this is disabled, that's gonna be bigger than the move instructions that we add for just stashing the pointer to the code tag. That's all we're adding. Wait, what? I didn't. I didn't understand that. For, for a trampoline, you have to have space in the code uh, to add your jump instruction later, right? To so add? It's, not. it's... The trampoline will be um, in its own section. No. To get to the trampoline, you have to be able to insert a jump instruction. To insert that jump instruction, you have to the, have the knot, call. Right? The call itself is replaced with a jump. So we replace, the, at build time, we replace the calls with jumps to the trampoline. Because it's because each trampoline is, um, it's basically emulating what you did, but instead of having the call there, we just move a jump to the code and then jump back. 
or like, you know, GCC can actually compile it that way. So if, like, if you made your little thing or wrapper around there and you did it unlikely in an if statement, it would, you know, jump down and jump back or something like that. But no, it's just basically moving this code out of line. That's all it's doing. So instead of doing the call from the call site, you do the call from the trampoline and you replace the jump or the call with a jump to the trampoline. It does yeah, this, your- This is getting really far off into the weeds. Hey, hey, can um, everyone, I, I just want to add something that is about 80% overlap here, but um, I was yeah, yeah. playing around with, with BPF trace and I, um, on a, you know, a, a live system that was already up and running that I wasn't supposed to reboot or anything. And the, the, big, the big thing that really hit me was all the static functions. I don't really mean static, I mean inlined functions in the kernel. It effectively turns out to be the same thing. And so, you know, if you can grab a file and, and uh, recompile it so the functions aren't static, then all of a sudden they become magically available to, uh, to BPF trace. And so then I started poking around and, you know, well, what's the best way to address this? And the current way is, well, you, you write in trace points. So when, when I saw this on the screen, I kind of lit up and I thought, oh my gosh, if they're gonna put all this in the, in the code in some form, then all of a sudden, a whole bunch more functions are gonna, are gonna light up and be visible to BPF trace because somebody's gonna go in and say, well, this is, I need this visible, I need that visible. Now, how this fits in is if you, you, if you take this approach and then modify it with Steven's approach, then, then I get what I want as well, which is all of a sudden, uh, you can do all of the above because these annotation sites double as additional traceable sites, which were, some of which were static functions before and were invisible. I'm, I'm not at all following how that's relevant to what we're doing, to be honest. So, uh, so um, the, the overlap that I see is that this is all about saying I have a running kernel and I need to know more about it. And that's precisely what the BPF trace mm -hmm. problem is, uh, is, is trying to do and BPF trace is falling, falling short. And so this, this helps with that. And if you merge the two, then you get a nice um, extra little boost. For, you know, you're doing the same thing, but you're, you're enhancing both tracing and you know, this. Maybe I'm not familiar enough with uh, what problems you're trying to solve with BPF trace. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I had a kernel hang and uh, you know, the code goes in and it doesn't come out and then everything's running. And you know, the question is, well, where? Uh, and you can start off with uh, sysrq and it tells you what the backtrace is and then you say, well, that's nice, but whoever wrote this code has many, many layers of functions and they've, they've nested all the way down the, and you'll never be able to figure it out. It's kind of like saying, okay, where, where's the memory? Like, oh, well, it's in uh, K malloc, <laughs> right? You, you need to know what happened. And so by uh, what I ended up doing here was I ended up, uh, you know, c compiling out or deleting the static keyword, rebuilding and rerunning and then BPF trace lit up and showed me where it was. So then I immediately said, well, hey guys, can I take your kernel driver is, and, <laughs> they said no. This sounds like something wholly BPF specific. Uh, this is not something that I've personally run into at looking at backtraces. Uh, standard kernel backtrace functionality candles static versus non-static just fine. Uh, I, that's why I piped up it, just to point out that um, it, it can happen. <laughs> and, and BPF is very good at helping solve that I, kind of thing. This I, kind I of instrumentation know. is also really fantastic, and I think, uh, again, combining them is going to lead to goodness. Steve kind of answered my... I, I was uh, concerned about kernel corpse size, like the, the, the size of the kernel is important and uh, we have people turning on config options to make the kernel smaller and stuff. So the chances of this, all this stuff being useful, whatever the approach might be, uh, we should uh, consider kernel code, code size. Yeah, but basically what I said was that po both approaches are uh, the same with code size. Yeah, the code, code size wise, they are same. Uh, there's a config to disable it completely, so compile it out. So. For people who cannot cannot tolerate, you know, increased size, they can just enable disable it. Right. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, ideas? 
uh, okay, so, 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 so my one comment is that uh, whatever approach is going to be used, uh, please make uh, it possible to free the memory uh, for the counters. So I, I, it looks like you use page ext, right? Uh, to, yeah, and that's not freeable. So if it was uh, um, possible to, to unreserve something, um, I, I mean, think it's freeable if there is page extension have page ext ops which have the need function. Uh, it, it does, uh, but uh, I, I think it's only called during boot when it's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so our, our, our boot switch. You need to enable it at, at the boot. Yeah, you need to disable it at boot. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it, but I don't see a direct way to do it right now. So, like, you, you boot a system, you just uh, look at the stats, and then you disable this feature and free the memory, then this would be quite useful, I think. Another thing that we could do to, to free memory that we're not doing yet is those L sections could be freed the same way that init uh, sections get freed after boot. Yeah, those sections are not that big, though. If you look at the breakup, uh, if we did that, though, then essentially all the overhead would be gone if it was flipped off. The biggest sections are page yeah. extensions, slab extensions, basically. Everything. Yeah, but those, those won't be getting allocated if it's disabled at boot time. Uh, yeah, I think the question, uh, the ask is to do it at runtime, basically. Once you don't need it, you want to disable it, so it's not. And another thing is if we do like the approach I said with the trampolines, you could actually free it. So basically you could boot up with it all running mm. and then free it. it uh, yes, that That's approach, that what I just said. Well, no, I'm saying, well, wait, which, well, I'm saying, uh, well, the actual, like the injection sites. And oh, 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 you mean the, the yeah. sections? Yeah, they are yeah, not that. They are, yeah. yeah, they are like 900K with per CPUs and 312Ks. So um, the bulk of this comes from the back pointers, basically, because you have to have back pointer for, for every page, for every slab allocation. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I, I, yeah, like we said, uh, page X cannot be freed today, but I don't think that's yeah. anything fundamental preventing to implementing the freeing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and document that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike thinks it's not that simple. If it gets allocated late enough to be allocated with vmalloc, you can free it. But if it's allocated at boot with memblock, we don't really have something that frees memblock allocations afterwards. We do that with huge TLB. We unreserve it. So the. There is no common infrastructure. Like huge TLB does it, I think, CM, CM, no, CMA doesn't do it. Uh, so huge TLB does it in a way, but there is nothing like common API. You, you'd need to generalize it, probably. <laughs> but is there anything preventing creating that API in the common create? And it just, so in the future, we could free it then. Uh, and then, the, of course, uh, the next question is, uh, you can free PageX if you are the only user of the PageX, but if there are other, then you can't. Yeah. yeah. I think that this is not really important at this stage because, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be really nice to have it freeable, but that can come up later. Uh, as long as uh, you just have that feature as an opt-in so that you just enable that when you really want to use that, fine, that's not a problem. And regardless of what kind of solution that will be, uh, you need some metadata to track whatever you need. Mm -hmm. So. I think that discussion is not really the most important at this stage. I think that uh, it's probably much more important to decide whether we really want to hard code what we are tracking or have something more dynamic. Is it boot time opt-in right now? Yeah. Yep. The yes. overhead's all boot time opt-in, okay. Yeah, there is a config option to compile it out. There is a boot, boot time option to enable, disable it. Okay. Also, another note on PageX is that we are considering moving it from PageX to struct page itself because uh, 
actually using PageX has quite a bit more memory overhead than having it instruct page because it's a separate allocation that's not otherwise done. No, 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 no. That, that, I, I'm just repeating what uh, a general consensus in the room. No, extending struct page is hard stop. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please, 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 I please no. Big option. <laughs> just uh, where the overhead is coming? Uh, because I recently fixed a problem in uh, a page text where the flags, which is like uh, if if users don't use the flags, which was always built into the page text, uh, is not needed, then uh, it, it's removed. So. The, the, you should have no overhead if you don't use that flag. No, I, I think uh, Kent is talking about the runtime overhead for lookup page text. There's you, the, the you, performance overhead. Right. Uh, okay, no, not the memory overhead. Okay. Right. Possibly I was wrong about that. Anyways, that's not something that I'm wedded to either way. That's a discussion that's been ongoing on the list. I guess it's impossible if, if you extend the struct page to make it build time uh, option because yeah. That, that would be just a compile time option then. That's, that's what we were thinking as an option. One well, use, use case, case that I'm interested, I'm interested in hearing about is, is if I've got a gradual memory leak, um, I, I, I guess the, the, the use case I see in a prod a lot is I'll find a, a subset of machines on a, on a new kernel that'll just be leaking memory slowly. And I don't really care about totals or a comprehensive view of the system. I just want to see, I want to have sort of zero overhead memory or CPU until I notice something's wrong. And then turn on some piece of magic, maybe this, that then I can use to get traces about never freed allocations after that point. Right. And I'm willing to leave. I don't know if this offers that capability or not, but that would be cute. Right. The idea is you enable this minimum uh, information, basically, which tells you to just at this this, in this file at this location, uh, the, this, this is a memory allocation. So you collect that data. You can have like a user space daemon that collects that data and sees that there is a gradual increase. And once you but decide I, I, that, yeah. Can, go ahead. can I jump in here too? Uh, we also added in this patch set uh, an additional information to show memory port. Uh, this will grab the top 10 allocations and add them to the show memory port. So if you own, uh, if you've had that leak, you'll see it there. And well, I've ar already had this in the Bcache of S3, and it's shockingly useful. Sure. Uh, but I, I assume these are all turn it on and boot and wait for trouble modes. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't, I'm thinking oh, yeah, I don't want to turn it on. I don't want to turn it on until the encounters that are already in the kernel show I have trouble. So you, you want to have it off until? Yes. Uh, there's plenty of counters today that tell me everything's fine. And then every once in a while, I'll see, oh, the slab counters are growing out of control. Gee, where are they being allocated from? Let's call Kent and CERN and make more tracing, more invisibility happen for those for those call sites, which I can't identify. Well, so No, you have to have the accounting on from the start in order for the accounting to be able to tell you anything. OK, well, that's I guess my dream then in this maybe aren't going to line up together. Yeah, I mean, we all wish for zero overhead uh, visibility, well, well, but. but. But I guess if I'm willing to, if I'm willing, if this could be turned on dynamically, after boot, I could have it. Uh, if I can interrupt, there there is something already. I suppose it's, it's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, there's a BPF code. Um, it's called BCC, which is uh, you know compiled BPF tools. That somebody's already written something called Memlink um, that does that. And of course, since it's tracing, it's you can turn it on. Uh, at when you need it and then turn it off when you're done. And it will give you a, a backtrace of whatever it sees leaking, you know, starting starting when you, you did it. It's just, it's in the, it's already in the, the BCC distribution. Would you enable it in production? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, if you've got a problem, you, you would turn it no, on no. at that point. You need to identify that you have a pro problem, right, first. But that's the use case I heard here was that somebody says, oh, okay, I noticed I have a problem, now I want to turn on the tools. This addresses that. Uh, which brings me back, I'm sorry, it brings me back to my interest in doing something like this to add more points that are visible to the BPF system. Your, your annotation here would add more points. But I think the existing kernel, as, as it stands, plus the memleak tool written in BPF that already is there, will solve the case that I just heard. It will solve the case if you can reproduce the leak. 
Right. Well, that's what he just said. Right. Yeah. I can I can reproduce the leak. I just don't I just don't know which allocation site is leaking. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an easier problem in that case. You don't need it to be enabled from the get go. Where uh, I'm at least well, the problem that I'm trying to solve is when there is a leak somewhere in the field, I receive a bug report that there is a leak and I cannot reproduce because it happens once in a while. There are some preconditions which I don't know and I don't have enough information to, to track it down. Would you like to conclude? All right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we are out of time. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll continue with that. Thank you all.